topics, lecture A. So we're going to we, we're past the American War of Independence, but now we're going to start focusing more on the um, American Revolution or the Revolution within that continues on after America's independence and everything. So the Revolution in Revolution within. How did equality become a stronger component of American freedom after the revolution? How the expansion of religious liberty after the revolution reflect the new American ideal for freedom? What was the impact on slavery? And how the revolution diminished the freedom of both loyalists and Native Americans? So introduction. Abigail Adams became one of the revolutionary's most articulate and influential women. She was well educated in a time of women restrictions and where women did not often get educated. She married John Adams and wrote several letters to him and helped him um, in his political career. In 1776, she wondered, could the passion of liberty be among those accustomed to deprive their fellow citizens of theirs? Meaning, this was an attack on slavery. She was questioning the whole stance of slavery and this age of passion for liberty. Many Americans were uh, many American slaves, indentured service women, Indians, apprentices, properless men were denied full freedom. The struggle against Britain threw into question many forms of authority and equality. You know, as we go through this, you're going to see that a lot of the people will gain rights that no longer had rights. Now, we often um, categorize it, well, slavery remained, African Americans were denied, but the reality is many people that had been denied rights after the American War of Independence and the Revolution within are going to gain more rights, especially by 1815. Um, and we're going to explore that in this next part. John Adams said, We've been told that our struggle has listened to bands of government elsewhere, that children and uh, apprenticeships were disobedient, that schools and college, colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent to their masters. This quote shows that many leaders at the time feared that the American Revolution disrupted the national order of things, but you're going to see an expansion of rights for many of those lawlessness people that were portrayed as. But understand, as we go through this, um, you're going to see a drastic change um, occur in the Americas. And that's why America is going to be so profoundly influential um, in the coming years. Okay, democratizing freedom one. The dream of equality took place at three levels simultaneously. National independence, the phase in the century a uh, phase in a century-long global battle by European empires, and then conflict over what America should look like. So the dream of equality is three phases, and they all occur at once. You have the national independence of the country. You're going to have uh, a phase in a century-long global battle by European empires where the, the British are going to be constantly at war. And then you're going to have conflict over what independent America should look like and what it could, should be in the future moving forward. Uh, many rejected the established hierarchy that had been long in the colonies. Challenge to patronage, privilege, and fixed status, meaning just because you're in this status doesn't mean you should remain there, or just because you're rich doesn't mean you should remain rich. Obedience have been key for structuring the colonies and the British Empire. Your place in the pecking order, this is where you stay, and this is where you are meant to be. This was inequality. Henceforth, America, uh, freedom would be forever linked with this idea of equality and that you could challenge your position in society. Now, as we look at this freedom revolution, democratizing freedom, you're going to see some radical changes occur um, in the Americas, uh, America that is not necessarily echoed throughout the rest of Europe. Okay, democr de uh, democratizing freedom too, expanding the political nation. Did not undo male domination or subjected by women or slaves. Those two things will remain. Now, slavery's in and then women's uh, expansion of rights uh, will come later, but um, they will remain subject to men uh, during this first initial phase or freedom uh, revolution. Free man change was dramatic, though. Those that were not um, enslaved um, or had full rights and everything, are, free men are going to see dramatic change. What I mean by free man is they were not indentured, they were not slave, uh, they were not... Um, really anything rather than they were a white male who lived in the colonies, no matter of their economic status. So what you're going to see is this was seen through property rights. White men, for the first time, will be able to own uh, property at a high rate. Why I say a high rate, you have white men, in the, in the British Isles, 5% of men own land, very small percentage. In the colonies, 
50 to 80% in many cases own land. So you're going to have a drastic increase in land ownership, which was so, or was a huge place to say that you are a free man, that you have the control of your, your future, that you can vote, you can do all these things. Thus, the colonies is going to rewrite that narrative of what a true free man was. Democracy had several meanings during this time. Aristocratical or democracy is a system which entire people govern directly. They will. View, Aristotle said this was mob rule, um, which, well, mob rule does have some impact. I mean, this is one thing the founders, when they will rewrite the government and write the Constitution, are going to try to limit mob rule, and that's why we have things like the Electoral College. That's why we don't directly vote on every single item. They wanted to control against that. Challenge in common politics, many issues were discussed, such as universal male suffrage, religious toleration, and even the abolition of slavery. A military vet established uh, the, the tradition that service in the army en enabled excluded groups to take a claim at full citizenship. So that service in the army enabled excluded groups to stake a claim to full citizenship. What they're looking at here is the idea that you know joining the military could give you citizenship, but it wasn't the only thing that would grant you that. But it was important to be part of the, the military and that there were certain uh, freedoms and rights that would come being part of it. And think about today, uh, being in the military, there's a lot of additional rights or things that you qualify for. The revolution in Pennsylvania, near, nearly the entire uh, pre-war elite opposed independence. Fear of the rule of the rabble. This created a power vacuum that allowed lower classes to take action and basically take over the government. Three months after independence, created a new constitution that did away with property requirements for holding office, abolished the office of the governor. Uh, and what you're going to start to see is in the colonies, so the whole idea to own property, where a lot of people own property, was great. Yay! But then it's going to even go further when that property right, right though 80% in some cases own land in the colonies, they're going to like, hey, you don't even need to own property to be able to vote. As long as you are on your feet and you are a free white man, you should be able to vote. That's revolutionary. No longer is the right to own land the sole requirement. You could have the military service, you could have property, you could just be a good standing citizen, and now you have the right to vote. So when Pennsylvania does away with that land requirement, that is huge, and it's going to start a trend that is insanely awesome. Now, the new constitutions. Um, democratizing freedom for. Every state adopted a new constitution after the revolution agree, agreed the governments must be republics. Authority rested on the consent of the governed. The biggest thing that each of the, the colonies are going to say that now the 13 states are going to say the consent of the people is key. And this is going off of John Locke, you know, um, uh, Thomas Hobbes, all these political writers are talking about you give up some rights for protection, but at the key of it, you must have the, the consent of the governed. And this idea that a republic, you elect uh, leaders. And this is going back to the old Roman model before they were the empire in which the Romans would elect people to make decisions for them. John Adams in 1776 published Thoughts on Government, which insisted that the new constitution should create balanced governments to reflect the division of society between the wealthy and ordinary men. Wanted a strong governor, judiciary in each state. Basically, he wanted some hierarchy because he did fear mob rule, but at the same token, he wanted a strong governor and judiciary in each state to balance each other out. Adams called for a second house legislature were followed by every state except Pennsylvania. Georgia and Vermont, only Massachusetts, Adams' home state, uh, gave the government an effective veto over assemblies. What they're starting to look at here is a balance of different branches. Americans had long resisted efforts by appointed governors to challenge the power of colonial assemblies. But what they're going to start to see finally is they're going to move past their fear of a strong governor and others and realize that if you have multiple branches of government working together, it can be a very effective as in a check on balance. The big thing about checking the assemblies was they didn't want to take the voice of the people away. Now, the right to vote, democratizing freedom by the right to vote. John Adams believed removing the property requirement was wrong and that these men had no judgment of their own. Why Adams would have disagreed with that was because, uh, especially the upper class, believed that owning property, even if it was only a small amount, there was some um, judgment that you, basically you were fulfilling an obligation and you had some responsibility, that you understood more that you were more in tune with everything. However, that obviously is going to go away at some point. But you can see that there is some pushback of giving everyone rights. In the South, democracy gained the least ground. All stopped short of universal suffrage in the South. Uh, really what you're going to see, not just the slave uh, denial, but you're also going to see poor whites denied a lot of rights because the plantation owners, the rich Southerners, want to keep 
the almost medieval hierarchy that you will see by the Civil War time, where you have a large plantations, think of Gone of the Wind, the elites, the super rich in the South, then you have a lot of middle commoners that are, you know, don't really have any slaves, they're doing okay, and then you have a lot of poor white farmers uh, with no rights, really not having any say, they're working, they're tired, they're constantly, um, and they're, then there's no social mobility for them. Uh, Pennsylvania did away with the property owning but required paying taxes, so what they're going to say is you have to pay taxes to be able to vote, and that's where that key is going to come into that. Uh, and doing this, so there's going to be some requirement there to be able to vote. New Jersey allowed all eminent inhabitants who met a property qualification to vote. Women could vote, mostly widows, until 1807 when the term was changed to male. So initially, even a state or two gave women the right to vote. And then it's going to be quickly uh, taken away, as you can see in 1807. Okay, toward religious toleration. Uh, the religious impact, Catholics, Jews, and even dissenting Protestants were persecuted if they were they were against the status quo. Baptists were jailed for not paying tax to support local congressional ministers. A lot of this is going to be more in the northern New England area where you still have that push for the old Puritan congregational church where they don't want a lot of differences. They want religious freedom, but yet they don't want anyone disagreeing with them. Though you have a huge offshoot of denominations, you're going to have people that are going to not want challenges to the system. Catholic Americans, War of Independence weakened the deep tradition of American and Catholicism. France was deeply Catholic, and it was an ally, so there was some strength there, but John Carroll was the first Roman Catholic bishop and received a cordial welcome in 1791. But uh, Catholics will not always be deemed as welcomed, mostly for a couple reasons. One, the Scots who came over were deemed to be really, uh, and the, the Scots and Irish were deemed to be drunken crazies that when they got riled up were kind of nuisance, and they were mostly Catholics, so they tied that. And then the fear that the Pope might uh, try to control any Catholic in the colonies. Now, separating church and state, a revolutionary leaders viewed religious doctrine through the Enlightenment, rationalism, and a little bit of skepticism. A lot of them were deists. They believed in a benevolent creator, uh, but not a supernatural interventions on a daily basis. Basically, what a deist was they probably they would acknowledge God, maybe even Jesus and all that. And I'm saying it's Christianity specifically. But then they said God kind of removed himself from the rest of the world and let things go on toward religious toleration too. Now Jefferson's going to write what's called Wall of Separation, Free Politics of Religious Control. States de-established their established churches post-independence and new constitutions were created, meaning though religion could exist and there was there was a place in it, the taxing, the support of the church, making paying taxes to support a centralized church in a town or an area was done away with. Uh, and basically that's what Jefferson said. You need to have a separation. It's okay to have religious freedom, toleration, and all that but you need politics and religion to be two separate things. Jews still face problems, uh, as they still even to this day do. Catholics gain the right to worship without persecution. And so you will have gradual expansion of the Catholic rights, as I excluded or uh, talked about earlier. Now, Jefferson and religious freedom. Bill of establishing religious freedom introduced in the House of Burgess in 1779 by then-Governor Jefferson. It limited religious requirements for voting and office holding and finance and support for churches. James Madison stated that about separation of church and state, the United States was an asylum to the persecuted and oppressed uh, every nation and religion. Influence or religion actually increased after this, and several new denominations sprang up across the country. Meaning, though they removed religious requirements from voting, and there was kind of some redaction of religious rights dealing with the government, new denominations and religion will spread across more rapidly across the country because they're going to get the government out of it and let them kind of do their own thing, which people have failed to realize that historically, when you remove the government, often things are much more successful um, in the country. Towards re religious toleration number two, Christian republicanism, uh, religious and secular language um, mirrored into the struggle of independence. Both evangelical religion and republican government believe that the absence of some kind of moral restraint, human nature was likely to succumb to corruption and vice, meaning what they generally agreed upon was uh, they needed some moral compass, and the moral compass that most of them agreed upon was a Christian uh, philosophy or Christian um, principles, such as the Ten Commandments and such. Thus, God was on the side of Americans, and all the war of this was divinely sanctioned event. So they're going to tie in religion as a divine element, and why this new country is emerging, why we're successful, why it's uh, changing, and why it's good. Anytime you tie religion into a movement, and this movement of freedom in the colonies, now the new independent country. Uh, you're going to have a much more powerful message. Uh, a, virtu a virtuous uh, citizenry. So, uh, 
Patriot leaders worried about the character of future citizens and what they would be after all these things were changed. Plans for free state-supported schools were submitted, though they will come later. Jefferson wrote that the, the no nation is kept to be ignorant and free, meaning we need to be educated and support our schools. Diffusion of knowledge was essential for a government based on the will of the people to survive. And this ties in, they used religion as a means to educate people, but they didn't necessarily want it always to be through a religious context on everything. But what we're getting at here is towards a religious toleration and then, you know, a citizenry that has a good moral compass is religion will be removed from some aspects of the government, but then it'll become even more impactful and more untied uh, afterward. Um, and that being said, just because they're going to look to make people good people, and that's what they use as their basis. Um, so, yeah, this, this takes us through the religious toleration. Um, and this is, you know, in the 1780s and 1790s where all this is really coming to a fruitation. Uh, and what you're going to see here is, uh, though we have not got to the Constitution yet, you're going to start to see a transformation during and after the War of Independence and what we call the, the bigger aspect of the American Revolution that more and more people are going to gain freedom than they ever did before in the rest of the world. Though it is still limited on some aspects, this whole change is going to shake and transform the world. Thank you. Have a good day.